So good evening and again, welcome to UNE's one night teaching on climate and justice. My name is Ariana Walker. I'm a sustainability and business major here at UNE and I'll be graduating next spring. And I'll be your moderator for this evening's panel on solutions for the future. So to start, I wanna get us going with a Native American proverb that has stuck with me since the first time that it came across my eyes. So I invite you to listen very closely. We do not inherit the earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. I'm gonna say it one more time because repetition leads to better comprehension. We do not inherit the earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. With that said, it is of the utmost importance our solutions to these issues that we face today align with the idea of sustainability and affording our generations the same opportunities we have had for growth. As every one of us knows, our growth in the future must look very different than the growth that we are experiencing right now. Tonight, we have a series of panelists to my left, each of which will speak for about five minutes on their topic. And after each of them present, I'll open it up for questions. With that said, please make note of any questions or comments throughout the presentations and hold them for the end during our discussion. So our panelists for this evening, to start with Dr. Michael Daly, an Associate Professor of Economics here at UNE. He'll be presenting on subsidies and energy trends. Moving to Zoom, we have Jamie Vasinka, Dr. Jamie Vasinka, Professor of Physics at UNE. He'll be presenting on green energy storage, and he is joining us from Germany, which is very exciting. Um, next, we have Susan Faraday, an Associate Professor of Marine Affairs at UNE, presenting on moving targets with a focus on climate change and fisheries management. Following, Dr. John Waterman, Assistant Teaching Professor of Philosophy at UNE, presenting on vegetarianism, as an overlooked climate solution. And lastly, Justine Bassett, Director of Innovation and PD Merrill Makerspace at UNE presenting on Earth Optimism. So we're gonna begin this evening with Dr. Michael Daly. So will you start us off? Thank you. Thank you, Ariana. I'd like to thank the organizers here, Lucia, Stephanie, and uh, Colleen, very good. I love what the Reverend said, uh, solutionary. It's such a great, you know, it's obviously about solutions, but solutionary is such a great way to look at it. Um, the science is clear. I think most of us here uh, can agree with that. Um, but very rapidly, I would argue that the economics is becoming clear too. And that's going to make all the difference in the world. And those that are into systems thinking understand tipping points. So, uh, I, I maintain uh, a kernel of optimism uh, that things can get done and will get done. Um, you know, we can track global emissions, the underlying process driving climate change, uh, and we can track it on a global level. But at the end of the day, as far as I can see, the solutions are all local. And they're local across, across the globe, uh, which also gives me hope because um, I think at least by, you know, by my age, I've come to realize that there are some things we control, we can control and some things we can't. <clears throat> and uh, things closer to home are a little easier to control, to have an impact on. Um, so with that said, I'd like to just go through uh, some trends, uh, both on the global level and the local level, uh, and with a couple underlying themes that will we'll tie together. Um, in recent years, uh, renewables have dwarfed generation um, conventional generation sources, both in terms of capacity and investment. In uh, 2019, nearly 80% of the net gigawatts generating, capa generating capacity added around the globe was in wind, solar, biomass, geothermal, and small hydro. So in the last few years, 80% of new investment capacity has been in renewables. As reported in Global Trends in Renewable Energy Investment 2020, investment in renewables buys more generation capacity than ever before, which of course helps governments deliver stronger climate action under the Paris Agreement. A dollar spent on wind and solar voltaic today, its deployment, results in four times more electricity than a dollar spent on the same technologies 10 years ago. Pretty rapid change. The economics is unfolding. 
The cost of electricity continues to fall for wind and solar, thanks to technological improvements, economies of scale, and fierce competitions for projects at auctions. Costs for electricity from new solar voltaic plants in the second half of 2019 were 83% lower than a decade earlier. The economics of investment. In 2019, now let's focus on capacity for a bit. In 2019, the amount of renewable power capacity was at its highest ever, 184 gigawatts, 20 gigawatts more than in 2018. This included 118 gigawatts of new solar systems, 61 gigawatts of wind turbines. In 2019, renewable energy capacity investment was approximately 280 billion just 1% higher than the previous year. So there's basically flat. It was the same investment, yet just in that year, we got an extra 20 gigawatts uh, of power out of the investment. Um, okay, so now let's uh, focus on both the last 10 and the next 10 years. From 2019, uh, from 2010 to 2019, there was 2.7 trillion in renewable capacity investment that totaled approximately 1,200 gigawatts. Currently, looking forward for the next 10 years, right now already um, committed is approximately 840 gigawatts, which is, which is not as good as uh, uh, you know, what happened in the previous 10 years at this moment. Uh, this could have been a disruption as a result of the pandemic. Uh, we're still trying to sort that out. Um, this capacity investment, though, which is, you know, 67, 70% of what happened in the previous 10 years, is only occurring at a cost of $1 trillion, as opposed to $2.7 trillion. So if you do the unit cost analysis and crunch a few ratios, essentially that means that if we were to keep investment at the same pace as the last 10 years, which I believe will happen, ultimately, um, you know, we're talking a doubling of the gigawatt. Right. 2,200, 2,300 gigawatts if we were to keep the investment the same. Again, talking to the, to the, to the shrinking unit costs of producing uh, renewable electricity. Renewable technologies, excluding large hydro, raised their share of global generation to 13.4% in 2019, from just 5.9% in 2009. So we're moving in the right direction. If we were to double or triple to that over the next 10 years, um, that would be more of a significant gain. Green energy finds itself at a crossroad. The last decade produced significant, significant product progress, but official targets for 2030 are you know, far short what's going to be required for climate change. Governments will need to strengthen their ambitions, not just on renewable power, but also on decarbonization of transport, buildings, and industry all three key areas where uh, greenhouse emissions have to be reduced. Currently, governments have an opportunity, as we're seeing, to take advantage of COVID-related uh, COVID relief packages and embed in those packages climate change dollars, which is also happening, uh, not so much in, in the States, but in Europe, for sure. Um, moreover, against a backdrop of relatively volatile fuel prices, growth remain. this is a key point, growth remains heavily concentrated in markets and sectors with clear governmental policies. And so there's two things working here now that, that I'm trying to get at. One is that unit costs are decreasing. And two is that to execute it and take advantage that, of that, more than ever, we need clear governmental policies. And I would argue those policies are most easily affected. If you're thinking of solutions for your generation, students here, um, these policies are most easily affected at the local level, the state level. And like I said before, you can count the numbers however you want, but the change is going to happen at the local level, at local levels around the world. Switch to Maine real quickly. Maine, Maine's energy mix has changed dramatically over since 1990s. 30% uh, of our electricity was nuclear back in 1990, 20 to 30% came from petroleum-fired facilities. Maine Yankee was decommissioned in 1997. Petroleum is down to 0.5% of 
of our usage for electricity generation. This is not talking about transport or home, uh, home heating. As of uh, 2019, Maine is actually a leader in percentage terms in renewable electrical power generation in New England. So we're doing pretty well in that aspect. Um, still, uh, still though, petroleum dominates uh, our total usage when you look at all three categories together. When you look at both transport, um, uh, residential heating and electricity. Um, petroleum still accounts for 40 to 45% of our usage, which is rivaled with renewables now, 40 to 45%. I'm gonna jump ahead real quickly and I think Salisa will come up uh, for the questions. Uh, I think I already got at this point. Um, with basically with, with decreasing costs, decreasing unit costs and a clear policy uh, directives, and orientations, I, I believe that we're really at a tipping point, uh, both here in Maine and elsewhere around the globe. Uh, so, don't, Jamie. so next up we have Jamie Vesenka, all the way in Germany, presenting on green energy storage. Guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Give me a thumbs up in the front stage there. Great, fabulous. Yeah, my name is Jamie Vasenka, and I'm speaking to um, my sabbatical leave in Germany right now. It's 1 a.m. in the morning here, so I apologize if I yawn at any time. I'm going to give you a brief overview of green energy storage. And first of all, the question becomes, what is, what are our green energy forms currently right now? If you would like to um, move the slide. Um, on the left-hand side are six bullet points that describe uh, various forms of non-CO2 um, generating energy. And, and nuclear is a really important part of it. Um, it is unfortunately currently on the wane in our country, and it's gonna be something that we'll have to explore in the future. Um, hydropower, very important component of it. And wind and solar, uh, as Michael said, are increasing quickly. You can see in the slides here, um, the uh, renewable energy forecasts show wind and solar increasing quite rapidly. Um, the left-hand bar charts there, it's important to understand that this, uh, the renewable energy sources currently, when it comes to electricity, they represent about 40% of the contribution to our electric needs. So 60% is still through fossil fuels. And overall, if you include industry and, and transportation, we still are using about 80% fossil fuels. So we've got a, a bit of work to go. Um, nevertheless, uh, the very encouraging trend on the right slide on the bottom there is to see that we are increasing right now um, our, our, our renewable um, uh, forms of energy. And um, the question is for solar and wind, how do we store them when the sun isn't shining or the wind isn't blowing? Um, so if we can go to our next slide, we have um, a couple different options for green energy storage. Um, I think if you go ahead and uh, do one more slight link forward, there's an animation there that'll appear. Jamie, you have control. Oh, I do. Interesting. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how that goes. Oh, there it is. I see down at the bottom. Okay, good. So yes, um, what I mean by hydroelectric pump is reservoirs. And in fact, the Tennessee Valley Authority, primarily uh, what they do is they take the energy from nuclear power facilities, they actually pump it up so um, into these reservoirs so it can be used um, during high energy needs. Um, something that's currently being worked on is compressed air, um, which is stored in the depths in the ocean. Uh, there are a couple of other technologies that have been tested, flywheels, massive wheels, um, very, uh, heavy and uh, the electrical energy is used to get them moving and then you can tap into them to uh, uh, extract uh, electrical energy later on. Heat storage is another way. Anytime you've got a heat differential, which is what fire power plants are just doing, they to generate electricity on heat differentials, you can um, heat up uh, a liquid through uh, solar or wind 
and then uh, have a heat pump, uh, some kind of heat energy of some kind afterwards. Um, hydrogen, there's a lot of hope for it, but it's a quite expensive uh, storage technology. You can electrolyze water into um, hydrogen, oxygen, and then uh, compress. The expensive part is the compression of the uh, hydrogen. And uh, lastly, capacitor, uh, capacitors and batteries are another forms of storage, which are their issue with them is energy density. Um, we, you need to have quite a bit of them in order to be able to um, use them uh, effectively in any type of um, situation. Um, all these technologies are being slowly um, uh, improved upon and being commercialized. And so there's a lot of promise in these particular areas, um, but we have quite a bit of a way to go. Uh, lastly, the energy trends. Um, right now, it is of course hoped that we will be able to reduce our fossil fuels, in particular our more uh, recent reliance on natural, natural gas um, and go more into renewables, which as shown in the graph at right, uh, largely consists of solar and wind power. And uh, these um, two forms are going to be the dominant um, uh, sources of our, uh, especially electricity generation in the future and finding the solutions to those particular um, obstacles in terms of storage so that we can use these around the clock. And of course, at high, uh, times of high energy needs are, uh, are the biggest challenges currently that they uh, um, are dealing with energy uh, usage in the future. But thank you very much for your time. And I've kept the timer on so we can move on to the next person. Thank you, Jamie. Okay, so we're going to move on to Susan Faraday. Um, so it's great to see everybody here. Thanks for hanging in at 7.30 on a Wednesday night. Uh, does anybody know that the Gulf of Maine is not warming up? It's warming up. It's warming up faster than any part of the ocean in the world. Um, this can be uh, very depressing to some of us who uh, have a little more mileage under our tires, uh, but it also presents a really interesting opportunity. Uh, that we can learn from and apply and share with fellow coastal and ocean residents. Um, so what happens when water warms is a whole bunch of stuff. Um, that's a scientific term, by the way. So, it, 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 so range, predator, prey, and life functions are the three categories that we tend to think about. So range is just things on the move. Things are moving. They have very specific temperature temp uh, 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 preferences. So when the, the temperature changes, they move to another place. Uh, probably our one of our best known examples of that is lobster. The range of lobster in the, in the Northeast has moved, it's probably 50 miles now in the last 20 years. We don't think of these little guys crawling along the bottom terribly fast, but they're marching along. They're going up and they're going out because they like cooler water. Uh, so that's range. Predator prey, well, so you can think about if something that likes to eat a lobster can't find lobster anymore, it's either going to find something else to eat or it's going to follow its prey. Uh, similarly, things that the lobster is going to prey upon may not be there either. Uh, one of the most alarming um, uh, indicators of this that I've heard about is a copepod called Calamus finmartricus. They're really fat and heavy in lipids. Um, uh, they're particularly uh, favored by North Atlantic right whales, which are terribly endangered. But just think about that, like the plankton is, that's the grass. That's the grass of the forest, of the ecosystem. So having a shift in plankton, you can kind of think through all those cascading effects. Uh, and finally, life functions. So if you're having as, a, as, a, as an organism to travel farther to find food or to find a mate, you're gonna have less energy to reproduce. We're actually seeing that exactly in the case of the North Atlantic right whale. Um, they're smaller, they're skinnier, they're not reproducing as, as, as efficiently as we would like them to try to recover that population. And that's because they're just expending way more energy and looking for food and their, their patterns are changing. Okay, so the, the subphrase of this presentation is history is becoming less and less relevant and geography is becoming less and less reliable when we're thinking about fisheries management. And I would suggest perhaps in thinking of other kinds of management as well. Fishery management in the U.S. is very complicated. It's highly regulated. 
but history and geography are super important. So our fisheries are managed on a regional basis. You can see in that map of the US, these nice tidy lines where everything's divided up. And of course, all the species pay attention to those lines, right? They don't move at all. But these lines made some sense for a long time. So, you know, the, the Mid-Atlantic and New England have very different ecosystems. There's some oceanography and geography that influences that. So that works reasonably well, except when things are moving and they're not where they used to be. Um, so geography is, is a challenge because the things that we've been managing in one place aren't there anymore. And new things are moving in and the New England Council may not have the authority, literally the legal authority to manage what's out there. Uh, another piece of management is uh, that fishermen have to get permits for what they're going to catch. And they're not easily transferable. You get your lobster permit, your ground fish permit, your crab permit, whatever it is. And if there's no crab out there anymore, but you're seeing a whole bunch of black sea bass, you don't have a permit to catch them. So that's another uh, sort of piece that gets complicated. Uh, in terms of trigger, uh, let me get back to history for a minute. So on the left-hand side there, you see a graph. This is kind of a depressing graph. It's the uh, uh, decline in, of Georgia's bank codfish. But uh, this shows sort of the information that fishery managers and scientists use to make a prediction about here's how much of this you can catch next year without pooching the populations, how you can keep the fishery sustainably. So we look at uh, how many fish are in the overall population, how many new fish, it says recruits up there, that doesn't mean that the fish are going to a military academy. It means how many fish are being recruited into the population to live long enough to reproduce. Um, and so you can look at the history of this and say, well, we, this, in this, this graph, it doesn't look like we can catch very many. So it's always this backward look in history that's been really important. Uh, so in terms of where, where the targets are moving, so the cre creatures are moving, obviously. Um, the science is not as nimble as the movements of the organisms and the changes in ecosystems. I think it's getting better. I'll talk about that as I'm wrapping up with the sort of solutions. Uh, our management system is very strictly constrained. Um, so not only is it based on geography and history, uh, the law has certain triggers that say when things are supposed to happen. So if a stock is overfished, managers need to do something about that. Um, if stock is depleted, they need to do something about that. They need to come up with a rebuilding plan. There's all these triggers for actions. Um, there's no triggers for what happens when a species moves in that hasn't been there before. There's no triggers that say, here's how we're going to switch these permits out when the crab fishermen can't, can't, catch, can't catch crab anymore. So there, there's a lot of thinking going on about, well, how are we going to handle this? Scientists are very aware of it. The fishing community is really aware of it. Managers are definitely aware of it. Uh, we need more real-time science that gives us, you know, instead of managing with a machete, with the scalpel, like seeing those fine-tuned changes. Oh, we're seeing this stock is on the move. Is it a permanent move? I don't know. Can we give a fisherman permission to capture that stock right now? And how quickly can we do that? Um, we need a much more nimble management system that isn't locked into geography, isn't locked into history, isn't locked into triggers that don't apply in a climate changed world. Uh, so it, one, one wackadoo thought that I have about this, you know, we've all been to a carnival, right? And you get like your 20 tickets and you can spend your five tickets on the roller coaster or you can spend one ticket on the merry-go-round. I personally, no roller coaster at all, mm -mm, don't need it. That kind of thrill does not do it for me. So I'd be on the merry ground, but then I can go on 20 rides. And if you're a, 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 a roller coaster junkie, you can only go on four rides. So you're making a decision about how to allocate what you spend your tickets on. We could come up with some kind of system like that, perhaps for fisheries management. You have so many points. If you're targeting a species like cod that's very vulnerable, to climate change and is really in bad shape, that's gonna cost you a whole lot of points. Or you just spend fewer points on a new species like black sea bass that is moving on up and there's plenty of it out there. The reason this is a wackadoo idea is because the management system has no way to like really deal with that at this point. But we need to figure, we need to get past geography and we need to get past history and we need to think about a more nimble way for managers to respond and fishermen to respond to the new. Thank you, Susan. Um, my name is John Waterman. I'm a philosopher. Um, <clears throat> I teach ethics and other classes here. 
Uh, I'm here to talk to you about an overlooked solution to, um, to, to climate change and, and climate justice, and that is becoming a vegetarian. Um, so if you have ever been in any of my classes, you know that I don't try and change your mind. I try and give you some tools for thinking about problems, but then I don't try and change your mind. Uh, I'm gonna try and change your mind tonight. <laughs> and I think that's okay because you came here, right? And, I, and I'm also not grading you. So those are like reasons why I feel like I can do this. And uh, I think the, the first thing is that vegetarianism is really an overlooked solution because in terms of like scope, Right, what we eat has as big uh, an impact on the climate as transportation, right? And it just never gets talked about like that. It just has as big an impact, right? So if everybody here like, got an electric car, that would help the climate, right? But that'd be really expensive and that transition is gonna happen slowly and it's hard. If everybody here became a vegetarian, it would have the same or larger impact on climate and we could do it now it would cost very little, okay? It wouldn't hurt you. Uh, it's actually pretty easy. It is an overlooked, easy solution. And it just doesn't get the same press that so many more bigger, complex, costly solutions do. And it, it doesn't get the press because it changes our identity. It changes how we understand ourselves. It changes our culture. But like, whew. I, I think it's the thing, if you want a solution, you can walk out of here today and do and have a bigger impact than almost any other single choice you make. Okay? And um, here's why like, the way we eat has as big an impact on the climate and on justice as, as anything else we do. And it's because eating meat and eating animal products is like super inefficient. It's super inefficient from turning like energy into calories that we can survive on. And it's inefficient because it takes way more space to grow food and then feed it to something and then eat that thing than just to eat that food in the first place. And I'll tell you, I have this new dog. His name is Sox. He is a Bernese mountain dog. He is seven months old and he weighs 70 pounds and it's nuts, okay? And I know how much he weighs and then I buy him food, all right? And I know exactly how much food he has eaten lifetime. He has eaten seven bags of 33 pound food, okay? So he's eaten about 240 pounds of food and he has turned that into 70 pounds of dog, okay? Now, it's like I confront the situation. I can eat socks and that's 70 pounds of dog or I can eat the dog food. And my recommendation to you is do neither. But like, <laughs> if, if you're gonna do one, eat the dog food because there's way more calories there than there is in my dog, okay? And it's just more efficient to eat the stuff that we feed to animals than to eat the animals themselves, right? It's just, it's just more efficient. And I'll tell you why that this is like a question of like climate justice, because the way that we eat, okay, affects people like far away from here who are vulnerable, okay? And it is because they want to eat like us or they want to diet like us or because we eat the way that we do that we are like steamrolling and paving the Amazon, right? That is to feed beef, okay? And that causes methane emissions. It just causes all sorts of problems. It has like direct impacts on indigenous people. And if we change the way that we eat, we like solve that problem of justice and habitat loss, okay? It's something that we can do super easily. And I haven't even talked about like the injustice that we do to the animals themselves, okay? And I will give you like two rules of thumb for like identifying when you are making a moral error, right? The first rule of thumb for identifying that you are making a moral error is that you don't try and argue why it's okay. There are very few good arguments why it's okay and it's good and you should eat meat. Rather, you make pragmatic arguments for why it's okay or it's not a problem, right? Oof, nutrition or something like that, or maybe there are good ways to eat meat if we eat just like the grass-fed, naturally ranged beef or something like that. That's not a reason to do it. It's a reason why it's okay. And when you make pragmatic arguments to justify your behavior, that is like an, that is a reason to think that you are trying to avoid something. And then the other, the other like signal that you are avoiding like a hard moral choice and you know it's right deep down is that you try not to think about it. And when we think about like all the harms of eating meat, or, like 
animals and the habitat loss. It makes us feel bad, and then we try not to think about it. That is a signal. That is a signal that we are doing something wrong. And we should like attend to that signal, right? Think about it hard, and then make a choice. Like, and so that's like the, the, the hard pitch I'll make to you guys right now, okay? 5% of Americans are vegetarians, but like if we all were, like that would make a huge impact. All right, so thanks. I can't believe that I got the last spot of a three hour teach-in. <laughs> this is a, a tough uh, spot, but I'm gonna tell you, I'm Justine Bassett and I'm the director of innovation and I run the makerspace here on campus. And one of the things that I love about innovation is that it's all about positive future change. To be an innovator, you have to believe that the world can be better. Nope, you can't look at that. <laughs> so I wanna introduce you to a friend of mine, the guy in the middle, his name is Afro Shaw. He's one of my personal heroes and I hope after this, he's one of your heroes too. That's me on the left. And Afro's is a lawyer. And as lawyers do, he bought a beautiful apartment overlooking the ocean. The problem was, as you just saw, that the apartment that he bought was overlooking the ocean in Mumbai, India. And the beach was called Versova Beach. And it looked like this. And Afros, um, as somebody who had a deep love of the ocean, was really um, horrified and upset by what this beach looked like. And so he went out. And he started cleaning it up. Crazy, right? And then he had an elderly neighbor um, who started to help him. And uh, they created a WhatsApp group and they started coordinating ground action. And pretty soon they had a couple hundred volunteers. And within a year, they had 1,500 volunteers. And you could start to see some change on this beach. Within two years or 85 weeks, the volunteers had removed 11 million pounds of trash. And the beach, after two years, and let's just hope this doesn't skip ahead again, or this, um, the beach looks like this. And that came from Afros believing that he could make a difference and going out every weekend and coordinating and inspiring other people to join him. In 2018, after 148 weeks of cleaning this beach every single day. They had removed 44 million pounds of trash and the beach welcomed back olive ridley sea turtles. And these sea turtles had been missing uh, for 20 years. You can imagine after that first picture, what turtle wants to live on that beach? Um, so the change was incredible and promising and it started with Afros. Afros was named a UN champion of the earth. And uh, he continues to this day to not only continue to clean this beach, but to work within India. And, uh, and I'll tell you more about that. So I'd like to talk about what this means to innovation and why I'm so inspired by his story. And uh, some of you here are in our innovation programs and hopefully you'll recognize some of these lessons. The first thing, um, that I'd recommend if you want to make change happen is a bias towards action. Uh, Afro Shaw, how successful do you think he would have been if he had tried to organize a Zoom call with the municipal authorities to talk about that beach? Would he have been able to make a difference? Probably not. But by getting out there and actually taking action, he made a difference. In that first picture where uh, we were outside in the rain, I went to a conference with Afros and by the second day, that guy was going crazy. It was his first time in the US. It was Washington, DC. He didn't want to go see the monuments. He said, why is there so much talking? We should be cleaning. And he inspired me to organize a river cleanup. And we got a group of people. And we left the conference. And we started taking action ourselves. So taking action, there's such an energy to actually doing something. The second thing is focusing on people. I teach a methodology called design thinking. It's human-centered design. One thing that I think Afros did that was really beautiful was he went to the slums around the beach and he asked them, uh, he tried to understand why aren't they, why don't they care about how awful this beach looks? Why are they defecating on the beach? And what he found out was that the toilets, the public toilets um, in the slums were disgusting and people didn't really have a choice. 
So part of his volunteer team now to this day goes and cleans those toilets, 52 toilets. And there was a beautiful interview with a young girl, an elementary school student who lives there. She said, we used to just throw our trash into the ocean, floats away, right? Now she collects her trash, she puts it in her pocket because she understands how important it is. But he had to have that compassion for them to understand um, why they would care about the beach. Uh, show, don't tell. This is, um, I think, again, just if you have an idea, making a prototype. Abby, I'm looking at you. <laughs> um, figuring out a way to show people what your idea is instead of just uh, talking about it. So much talking, less talking, more. Show your idea, display it, make it visual. People can respond to that better. Radical collaboration, I think we've heard a lot about that today. Bring people together from different constituencies. Afro's on that beach, he has celebrities, he has uh, slum dwellers, he has people from all different countries um, and, and they're working together. And I think when you talk to somebody from a very different background, you're gonna get very different ideas. I think that's been really exciting for our innovation students. Some of the projects we're working on, we're bringing faculty, staff, and students together in new ways. And it's been really exciting to see the conversation can be different. And finally, embrace experimentation. Um, really, I think I talked to students about their careers and there's so much pressure to figure out what do I wanna be? What's the one thing? My advice here, and if you wanna make change is try something, play with it. Have, a, have an attitude of exper playful experimentation and you're gonna learn more from that process. So prototyping is important. I'll end with Afro's, um, when he talks about uh, cleaning the beach, he says, you should go on a date with the ocean. And I think that's a really beautiful way of reframing it that we all, we're here in this room because we care so deeply about this planet. So whether it's the ocean or whatever it is for you, go on a date with it and, and uh, enjoy, thank you. I'll have you guys just hang on to that mic for questions. Um, wow, thank you so much for all of your comments on Solutions for the Future. I know it makes us all feel much better even after a three hour teach in that we have some solutions that we can move forward with. Um, and yeah, you gave us a lot of thoughts to contemplate. So at this time, let us all thank the panel right now. And now I'm gonna open it up for questions. All right. Okay, so my my question specific would be to Professor uh, Faraday, and it's in regards to management. So you talked a lot about how you could come up with that system that would diverge points essentially to help the stocks, but why isn't there much discussion about prepping for like the way the fish are going to be migrating in advance? Because if you know like the life history and if the temperature conditions are set for a certain species, they're going to be moving obviously north like the cod. Um, so is that not necessarily discussed as much because it's sort of just like avoiding the problem or? No, because it's glaringly obvious. <laughs> it's glaringly obvious to anybody that works on the water. Um, it's glaringly obvious to the scientists and the managers know it too. The, the, the problem is we don't 100% we don't understand each species, each commercial species vulnerability and sensitivity. Some species are gonna, you know, all, all, this, all the fishery scientists I talk to say, you know, it's easy to get bummed out about the, the decline of Atlantic cod, but they say, you know, there's gonna be climate change winners and losers. So we're not catching cod off our coasts anymore. Maybe we're gonna have a whole lot more black sea bass. Maybe we're gonna have blue crabs coming up from the Chesapeake Bay. You know, there's gonna, there's change. The problem is the management, the, the science being quick enough. Right now we do, we do management decisions based on trawl surveys that are two years old. And the pace of change is accelerating. So we need to think about that, about having science that is more nimble, more real time. Then we need to think about a management system that can use it appropriately. Because in addition to history isn't as reliable, geography isn't as relevant, climate change is not gonna be this nice steady trajectory. So if you're a manager or a scientist and you're seeing, holy crow, look at all these black sea bass in Casco Bay. Is it a blip? Is it there forever? Are we gonna have a cold winter and they're gonna ebb out? So then we've created a permitting system we've, or points or whatever, however we're gonna regulate that to give fishermen an opportunity to create a market, but then maybe it's gone. So that's, I don't know if I've answered that correctly, but we're clearly aware of the changes in these stocks. We just don't quite know what to 
do about it with our current system. One other, one other thought, which I didn't have time to mention. Um, we, manage, we manage fish stocks as one entity, one stock. Okay? What we know uh, with climate change is there's pioneers, there's leaders that are marching north, and there's guys that are kind of hanging back because they're not adapting as well. Um, so perhaps we should manage those pioneers a little bit differently because they're, they're running the heck out of there. They're clearly more vulnerable. Um, and maybe those laggards that are in the back that are adapting to warming temperatures better. Maybe we should manage to protect them more and give the stock an overall chance to recover. But we, we don't manage it that nuanced of a way. Um, one more quick thing to add to that, if you don't mind. So if you were then, say, able to know like one species biology really well, like the cod, for example, and like the specific breeding conditions that they have for like the population, would you be able to possibly essentially predict because you know where that fish is going to go with regulations that way? Do you think it's actually like essentially possible to make regulations based off the future or is it just not realistic because we don't know enough? I, I mean, I think we're learning more all the time. So I think it is possible. And I think we think we think we have to, honestly. So thank you. Um, thank you, Justine, for the shout out. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, my question is focused more towards Mike, um, going back to capacity and renewables and investments. What incentives do you see for economists and investors to continue to put money into renewable energy if the capacity of energy is going to continue to grow exponentially without largely investing into them? The very last part of that question. So investors and economists are putting money into renewable energy and they're seeing large outcomes in the capacity of energy. So what is the incentive for them to continue to put money into them if they're already seeing outcomes? Well, <clears throat> the incentives will continue to be profits. I mean, it is, in, from my perspective, um, it's, it's folly to think that we're gonna suspend markets or the profit motive completely to get us out of this pickle that we're in. There's just no way. Um, further, you know, and I would say that when markets are allowed to work in a constructive way, uh, costs keep coming down as a result of uh, scaling up the activity. Um, really, I think one of the key leverage points right now is simply to get governments out of the way of subsidizing the fossil fuel industry. Um, I, I don't see how we can get out of this problem, given the nature of Western civilization and the individualized type cultures that we have. Um, I don't see how we can get out of it without harnessing that power. Markets can have constructive power too. Um, and, and at this point in time, costs are coming down. Uh, just in Maine, for example, a, a really simple change. Um, the previous administration in Augusta did away with net metering. Uh, the PUC actually had a, ru uh, a rule change, the Public Utilities Commission, which got in the way and created uncertainty. The new administration came in and emergency legislation put community solar and um, net metering back into effect. And almost immediately where we had, we, we gained 50 megawatts of solar production in the previous 10 years. In the last two years, it's gone to 500 megawatts of, of investment. And, and it was just simply getting the government, getting policy to be clear, because the worst thing that you, an, an investor wants is uncertainty. Okay, and then I have a question for uh, Dr. Faraday. Um, due to the warming of the Gulf and as a result of the migration of Maine's lobsters, um, do you think that we're gonna see a depletion in fisheries in the Gulf of Maine, or do you think that they will adapt to the new conditions? Uh, yes, to both. Um, I would suspect uh, that Maine as a state is gonna be very reluctant to give up its identity with the lobster. It's on our license plates for crying out loud. Um, I don't know how much folks are hearing about the controversy of regulations to protect North Atlantic right whales and adverse impacts on lobstermen. I mean, it, it's very heated, it's very polarized. Here's the reality. The lobstermen know 
they know the lobster are marching north. The catch is way down east. That's where all those bazillion pounds are being caught. It's not, it's not off of Saco Bay. It's not off of Portland. We, they know this. Managers know this. They know that fishery has got, it's got an expiration date on it. They're getting their Canadian passports and they're getting the heck out of here. Um, but the, the narrative that you hear is we have to save the lobster industry from the right whales and the environmentalists. The, it's it, behind closed doors, people are like, yeah, we know this is on the way out, but they can't say it publicly because it gets in the way of that story, right? You know, the Reverend talked about the power of story. So uh, the question is, you know, are, our managers, our scientists, our tourists, are they gonna be willing to embrace that change instead of having a lobster roll, having the black sea bass roll? Why not, you know? Um, and to build that in as a positive, innovative, so we can, we can find solutions to this. I mean, I think fishermen are gonna be forced to, but the, 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 the narrative and the culture is really in. All right, this is for uh, Dr. Vasenka. I remember uh, earlier you talked about uh, energy storage and you. You mentioned battery, electrical batteries and such, but you also mentioned some more non-traditional stuff. So can you, uh, can you give me a couple of examples of how that would work? Well, uh, one was the flywheel technologies. Quite a few of these other innovative techniques are, they, they made these test facilities and they showed that they can be very productive. Um, the flywheel technology is, um, they've been used on in, in mechanical equipment for many years. It's basically you get something spinning, it has a lot of mass and it'll keep on spinning and then you can tap into it in order to generate um, energy um, to generate electricity or whatever. Um, some of the other techniques, as I mentioned, uh, uh, there was a lot of hope for hydrogen, the hydrogen economy. And you may recall in the past that there were various kinds of vehicles that were going to be hydrogen powered. Um, and this can be done through two different mechanisms. You can burn the hydrogen um, and uh, it burns very clearly. It just makes water after you burn it, or you can run it through fuel cell. Um, the biggest headache with it is it has low, what's something called energy density, okay? Um, you need a lot of hydrogen um, in, uh, in order to get the same amount of uh, energy that you would get out of, for example, 10 gallons of gas. And it consumes a huge portion of your vehicle if you go ahead and um, use that kind of technology. The same challenges, of course, is happening with um, um, electric vehicles and, and battery technology. Um, you've got very limited range if you want to have a vehicle that can actually carry people um, within it. Um, capacitors are a way of separating charge, um, which can be generated uh, by, um, uh, from electricity, and then it can be reused in order to run things. And in fact, uh, you know, it's the basis of a lot of uh, technologies that we use all the time uh, in computer technologies. Um, to run, once again, though, large things such as a, a bus or whatever requires really large capacitors. They, they lack the energy density. Um, some of the more interesting ones are these uh, ways of pressurizing gas in order to, uh, they, you take the wind energy or solar energy, and then you would, um, push gas into containers, um, which could then be released in order to turn turbines and then uh, uh, supply electricity to, to cities. And uh, there's been a variety of these test uh, facilities. They've all been successful, but I think it really comes back to the kinds of things that Michael was talking about, which is, you know, can the market be given a chance to um, find which of these solutions are going to be the most uh, um, uh, efficient and therefore um, useful in terms of helping us uh, take these these two really dominant um, renewable technologies of solar and wind and be able to make a more even distribution of energy um, for uh, humans to use. I don't know if that answers your question, but um, 
Thank you. You're a trooper. I can only imagine how tired you are. <laughs> My brain doesn't work that early in the morning. Um, so we're coming to the end of the hour. I'm going to have to cut off questions, but I thank you all for a lively discussion. And again, thank you to our panelists. You guys are awesome. So let's give them one more round of applause. And then on behalf of all of us concerned about climate change and justice, I just want to thank you all for attending this evening's teach-in. It was very long and you made it to the end, but we got a lot of very important information and I hope all of you have something to act on when you leave here today. So this concludes the programming for the evening. And yeah, we hope you've learned something and go and talk to your family. And uh, yeah, thank you guys so much. Thanks, Jamie. You're welcome. Bye-bye. At your teach-in, you've discussed concrete actions you can move forward in your community. Time is short for climate and justice. Help others move from climate despair to climate action. As the young people say, now, not next month, not next year. Let's commit today together to create a just and sustainable future for people and planet. Thank you all for becoming leaders on climate and justice. Obrigada a todos por se tornarem líderes em clima e justiça. Thank you all for becoming leaders on climate and justice. Jalvayu or Nyaipar worldwide teaching mein aap sabhi ka swagat hai.